investing your time and spending your uh, working day with us. I hope you have enjoyed. I hope you have made connections and I hope you have feel inspired. So again, the most important part of International Women's History Month is celebrating women heroes around the world. And every year, we select, celebrate 60 women, powerful women, for doing incredible work around the world. And this year, it is our honor to celebrate Mandeline Dinono as the World Women Hero for her relentless dedication in fostering inclusive and uh, inclusive uh, media and entertainment portrayal across um, family entertainment and also fighting biasness in family entertainment. Mandeline um, amplifies women voices and advocates for gender equality on international stages and shapes a more e equal future for future generation. It is our honor and privilege to have Mandeline Dinono as the World Women Hero. But to present this award, I would like to invite Sydney Cohen, one of the fierce advocate for women behind the scenes and a force of change to present this award. So since we have two powerful women with us, uh, Mandeline, maybe we would like to have first some remarks from you before we get into the fire chat conversation. Oh, sure. Um, well, first of all, um, I want to say I'm so thrilled that Rupa has started Women World Hour and all that she's doing around the world to empower women and girls. So I think we should give her a big round of applause. Uh, it's really about collective impact, and uh, you know I have the privilege of serving as the president and CEO of the institute. And um, you know what we found is it takes all of us together uh, to really make systemic change. So it's uh, we're just doing our part, but it's all of us uh, coming together. So thank you very much. <laughs> We had all these questions written, but I'm going to just put them on the floor and we're going to just speak we're gonna naturally. We're going to have a chat. So um, everybody, I'm so honored to sit here and be speaking to Madeline. And I have so many questions for you because your career is so varied. I mean, you went from a publicist, you're in charge of consumer goods, and then you went all the way to launch your own channel and then running the Gina Davis Media Group. <laughs> No, they can't. Ooh, can you guys hear? Oh, no. So, Madeline, why don't we start like one thing at a time because sure. I just inundated you. So, you started as a publicist with ABC. Can you? Actually, um, I started working at ABC uh, when I was 17 uh, as an intern. And I have the privilege of being the first person in my family to go to college, uh, my parents, you know, my family descends from Italy, Italian American. Uh, neither of my parents had a chance to go to a four year college. They went to professional and vocational. And so, with that, we didn't really have a lot of contacts. And I was really worried about getting a job uh, after college. So, I was really uh, lucky. Uh, one of our family friends, uh, my Uncle Frankie, loved dating powerful women. He would have loved dating you. Um, back, in, But anyway, uh, so he always had the most powerful girlfriends. And one of them was one of three assistants working for the legendary Rune Arledge, who at the time pioneered ABC Sports and what ABC News is actually today. Anyway, so I started doing internships. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew that by the time I graduated, I would be able to get a full-time job. So I wasn't a publicist, right. but I was able to land a junior position 
in uh, network publicity, and that's how that's the whole thing got started. That's amazing. And by the way, good thing for everybody to learn here. It's, it's you, you just pay your dues. I mean, the things that we all did coming up in our fields, um, you know, we all started as interns and assistants and climbed our way up. So hats off to you. Um, and then you went to Universal, I believe. No, that came after. Um, so at that time, back in the day, at that time, um, there weren't a lot of junior management positions. And I know we were talking about failures and setbacks and challenges. And so my initial goal was to be like one of the first female VPs of Wild World of Sports at ABC. Right. And at that time, that road just wasn't going to happen for me because you had to, um, and you would know this from production, right. you had to just travel, be a PA, mm -hmm. sleep on the floor, pay for yeah. your own way. And that was not going to happen. I had to pay the rent. Uh, so. Uh, with that, there wasn't a lot of moves that I could make at that time. And Frankie's other girlfriend, my, un my uncle Frankie really came in handy, was uh, dating a woman who was uh, a senior executive at Lancome Cosmetics. Wow. So that was my next job. And then I moved up into a coordinator position. And that was my foray into uh, marketing. And then from then, I was able to take it. I, I was good. Frankie had enough girlfriends, and I was able to make my way on my own and got into more on the agency side and yada, yada, yada. So all that said, um, I reached a point where I thought, you know, I really want to go back into entertainment. Um, what do I do? And that ultimately led to the universal thing. But it was, it was I'd say, the first time that I had kind of a, uh, you know, not a pivot, but kind of like a moment to rewire. Wow. That's amazing. I, I love hearing stories of how people came up. And then you went ahead and launched your own channel. I can honestly say I don't, I haven't been around many people that launched a network. And so tell us about that. Well, um, I, and I certainly didn't do this, and I wasn't the leader in it, but... Um, I had uh, worked with a phenomenal woman by the name of Susan Frank. She had been an executive at McDonald's, and we worked together when I was at Universal on um, Jurassic Park. This is going back to the 90s, the first release. And um, uh, she had been recruited by another legendary woman, uh, Margaret Lesh, who started um, uh, kids programming mm -hmm. for, for Fox and, and many, many others. And um, they both uh, decided to launch the Hallmark Channel. And so they recruited me from Universal to work with them to That's launch amazing. the channel. So I was uh, humbly privileged to be part of a, a management team um, to, launch, to launch that channel. So that's, that's, that's how that happened. Yeah, that's, that's, I have to say that's amazing. Um, and then you got into public speaking. So I'm sure everybody here wants to know a little bit more about public speaking. And by the way, you and I have both been able to speak um, at our illustrious government. I got a chance to speak in front of Congress for copyright infringement. And I know you speak at the State Department and the United Nations, which, you know, that alone is incredible. So I'd love to know all about that. Well, I think I think it's important to, um, I think public speaking is important, but it really started out from just childhood being in performance and being, you know, a thespian and being in band and, you know, all of that. So I'm a talker, as you could tell. Um, it's easy for me to talk. So that was just a natural extension of either representing what you were marketing or what you were pitching or what you were selling. And that just extended quite organically into you know, public speaking. Mm -hmm. But it was always grounded in what I was doing at the, mm -hmm. at the time. Um, and um, funny story, so my dear, dear friend, um, Sarah Denby uh, from UN Women is here, is um, when I first joined Gina, and she said, well, what do you want? And she, I said, what do you want? She said, well, I want world domination. Yeah. So I had a dear friend who was working um, with the UN and uh, we were able to secure Gina a closing keynote for uh, the Economic Council, they call it ECOSOC conference, 
where former President Bill Clinton had spoken wow. the year before. And I said, well, you want a world domination, let's just go to the UN. And that's how uh, eventually our partnership with um, UN Women also uh, began, which is very, very strong. I think, Sarah, it's like 17, I don't know, it's a long time, 17 years or something, 10 years plus. So um, yeah, so it's been great. Public speaking is amazing and hats off to anybody who raises their voice um, just to be heard, especially for everything going on in the world right now. So um, now you're at the Gina Davis company. Um, first of all, what is it like to have a powerhouse like Gina behind you? Do you think it opens doors? Does it help? Does it allow you to get your voice out there more? So there's, there can be good news and bad news uh, when you have a celebrity front an organization. And one of the things that was very important to me um, in meeting Gina is to make sure that she was the real deal and she is the real deal. What you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. um, she has the, the highest intellect, the highest integrity, rolls up the sleeves. She will do anything that we ask of her um, because lots of times people don't know if the celebrity is fronting a charity because they have to clean up their name or there's just something and then you know, people will say, oh, was she involved? I'm like, yeah, she just texted me like two minutes ago. So she's very, very involved, very um, um, active, and does the work, really does the work. So that's really important, especially yeah. if you're, you're gonna put your yeah. reputation out there. You wanna know your actor's gonna show up yeah. on set, the second AD, everybody that yeah. you've hired on your team is going to yeah. you know support you. It's the same thing for us. Um, and she is just a dream come true, it's one amazing. of the best people I've ever worked with. It's amazing. So how, I know that you guys are paving the way for gender equality. Um, what do you think, how, how do you guys do that in your company? So there's a lot of people tackling the issue. Um, you have my other friend, Rachel Lowenstein, who is here. You have um, Sarah Demby, who's here. Even my friend, Mary Susan Trout, who I didn't even realize was here. Um, everybody's tackling it from their end. Our lane is really specific, and it comes down to what Gina realized. Um, as a highly ac accomplished actor, when she started watching uh, preschool programming with her daughter, who was a toddler, she was shocked that she just didn't see a lot of female presence mm -hmm. in the world of make-believe. Mm -hmm. And that sparked her to take you know, action. Um, and so we focus on who is showing up and how, how are they showing up in content. Uh, we've always had an eye on what kids and families are seeing because think about it, all of us, we have so much unconscious bias, mm -hmm. but children don't. And we know that by the time children are six, their identities are formed, how they think about the world is formed. And so we thought, well, if we can create a media landscape that is kind of bereft as much as possible mm -hmm. of unconscious bias, of harmful stereotypes, then perhaps these children, boys, girls, non-binary, whoever is consuming this content can grow up in a world where if they walked into a room and it wasn't 50% female and diverse and inclusive, mm -hmm. they would think there's something wrong. And then maybe that would help inform their business decisions on who they hire. And, and so that's, we've always focused on content and we've expanded um, our vertical. So we started out in global TV and film, and then in about 2015, we moved into global advertising. Then most recently, over the past five years, we've moved into gaming. Wow. Can you just tell, tell us about one of the gaming? Yeah, it was very um, interesting. Uh, one of our funders, uh, donors, the Oak Foundation, which is based out of Geneva, was really interested about the power of gaming. And look, four billion people are gamers, everybody's a gamer. Um, and it's the fastest growing and largest segment of media and entertainment in the world. And so they were interested in looking at um, kind of toxic masculinities, which is something Sarah had talked about uh, before. And so uh, we looked at uh, the Twitch as a platform and was had nothing to do with Twitch, it was just a platform. We looked at the top streamers, we looked at what they were playing, and we looked at the comments in the chat. Mm -hmm. And essentially, uh, as you can imagine, 
99, I think almost 100% of those top streamers were white, heterosexual, or cis male. Um, there was a lot of um, comments in the chat in terms of um, uh, kind of toxic comments about uh, bullying, um, you know, homophobia, et cetera. Not really a comfortable place, you know, for women and girls. But on the flip side, when you think about gaming as a platform, it is one of the best and most engaging platforms for men and boys to engage mm -hmm. and to express themselves Absolutely. and to kind of reveal, you know, their thoughts. Um, so that's why the study was aptly called the double-edged sword, you know, of gaming. And as a result of that, uh, we were approached by a number of AAA game companies mm -hmm. to start kind of consulting and helping them Amazing. with their, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion journey. And then this past October, we conducted a paper where we kind of filled in the blanks and looked at every single article written about uh, inclusive game design, character design. So we took everybody's research, mushed it all into one paper, and now we're getting to release, probably hopefully in June, a free website that um, will have, um, it's one-stop shopping for diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, in gaming for game developers that they can just find out something in one okay. spot. Um, and it's a free online resource. So we're hopefully going to launch that in June. That's and fabulous. yeah, and in order to do that, we formed this global advisory of all the AAA um, game companies um, together. So we're really excited fabulous. about that initiative. That's really fabulous. I, you know, a movie that was groundbreaking, you know, as I'm sure for every woman in this room, was Wonder Woman. It literally changed everybody's concept of what a superhero had to be. You know, I like love to say that no longer did Superman need to save the day because Wonder Woman is here. Um, and I think it, as a female, if I ever had to say a movie that I wish I had been a part of or done, it would have been Wonder Woman. Can you tell me what kind of, of movies or TV shows skewing to that gender, you know, non-bias, I'll say, that you guys might be developing that we can know about, if we're allowed to know about anything. Well, we don't really produce content, um, but we work with people like you to yeah. influence you to use sure. a kind of an intersectional lens mm -hmm. um, in looking at your next script and yep. who you're hiring yep. um, behind the camera. And so, you know, we think there's been some wonderful movies like Wonder Woman and the Marvels and yeah. Wakanda Forever and, you know, and, and the proof of the pudding's in the eating. And we know globally that audiences want to see themselves on screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, movies that make the most money at the box office yeah. are the ones that are the most uh, inclusive. So even though we're talking about yeah. a social imperative, there is a business imperative. Yes. Same thing in television. And also in advertising, you will sell more stuff if your appropriately made commercial is placed next to an appropriately, you know, placed, you know, television show. Um, you will sell more stuff. Consumers will reward you. And particularly, we were talking a lot about younger consumers. They are hip. They will know yeah. uh, whether you're kind of sincere in terms of um, inclusivity and and your you know, social justice efforts. I mean, it is amazing to see for the first time that Marvel and DC movies, which is just another, uh, again, yet another superhero is somebody killing about 5,000 other males on screen. We've seen it, we've done it, it's not working anymore. And, you know, for me, it's about time. Um, you know, I'd like to see a little bit difference in films that are being made now. Our next film, um, that we are in post and has Daisy Ridley in it from Star Wars. And it is a film where she comes and saves the day. Um, you know, so I'm proud to say that we're kind of nudging our way into changing stereotypes on our own. Um, so package goods? Tell me about package goods, because I know that's on your resume, too, is something that you've gotten into. So after um, after leaving Lancome, I'm I, like, what's this thing, this marketing, product marketing? I really like it. But marketing in cosmetics is you're walking around with a lab coat and you're testing things on people. And I really wanted to learn more about traditional consumer packaged goods. So I went on the agency side. 
um, where um, I could work with a bunch of different clients and learn a bunch of different categories, whether it's beverage or spirits or salty snacks or et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that's really where that came to be. And that was also very attractive for Universal because at the time that I joined Universal Home Entertainment, they were moving from beta um, to VHS. And Home Entertainment was kind of the wild, wild west. And now you had uh, big retail outlets. This is like back in the day, you Blockbuster and Musicland and Suncoast Video and all of these major retailers. So it, it kind of forced the industry to take a page out of kind of classic package marketing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that all, you know, so that kind of was in service of where the industry was. And that's where that experience kind of dovetailed with what Universal needed to do back, back at that time. It's really impressive. So now I'm going to kind of dovetail to maybe some of your personal stuff. As a power woman, I know I've had to make sacrifices in my own personal life at different times. Can you tell me um, how is your own power affected you and how do you navigate both it both personally and professionally? I think I'm very blessed in that I grew up in a family that was very supportive. Um, hard work ethic, because again, coming from, you know, immigrants mm -hmm. to this country, so very kind of pragmatic, but I was supported um, to kind of pursue and, and navigate. Um, and I didn't have a career path that was dictated to me. So that gave me uh, a lot of leeway. And, uh, you know, funny thing or not, as I mentioned, I didn't, we, there wasn't any a path for me. I was obsessed with reading obituaries. Oh, my God. Yes, because I was searching I for, uh, I was searching to learn about other women that maybe had done some great things that no one knew about, because I was trying to figure out, like, what's my angle, where I'm going to navigate. So I loved reading obituaries. There were so many, and I know women weren't really written about as much in obituaries as men, but wherever I could find it, and I learned so much about so many other women that you would never know who pioneered this or who invented that. Um, so that was like one thing you know that I did because I was just searching. And I was like a female groupie. So instead of reading like People Magazine, you know, I was reading at the time like Working Women and just trying to like That's model right. myself after other women um, who were navigating kind of the corporate ranks. That's amazing. And have you found, because you came up probably around the time I came up, being in a very male-dominated industry, any of the challenges you personally had to overcome? I would say, um, oh, I got a good story for you. So, um, so I was uh, interviewing for a job for a major media company, and um, I went to the interview. I'm wearing like a twelve hundred dollars St. John suit and you know as professional as I can be and I thought we connected etc and then the recruiter who was a male said I don't know how to say this to you I'm like what he's like he didn't like your hair well wow. he didn't like your hair so I wasn't going to move up through the interview process wow. yeah so Amazing. yeah you know, I'm like, well, that wouldn't have been a good situation for me. Uh, you know, this is who I am. You know, this is how I wear my hair. And if you don't like curly hair and you don't like a strong woman or with a strong voice, then fuck you. It's not the right thing. Good for you. Good for you. I love that, by the way. Um, what do you think your superpower is? Um, I'd say I have a good sense of being able to read people um, and look beyond. Uh, one of the things I've always said is don't judge a book by a cover mm -hmm. and don't discard someone. Uh, just because it may not seem like that person could maybe help you, uh, think about all the people they may know. They may be in book club with someone. Mm -hmm. Their children may go to school with someone. 
They may live next door to someone. They may go to church with someone. You never know when you meet someone what's behind them. And I think I've always respected that. And a lot of people are so busy, they just won't take the time to meet with someone. Um, because, well, what, it's not money, or it's not going to do this, it's not going to advance my care. Why would I want to meet that? Mm -hmm. And you never know. And I think that's been my superpower, is just not judge, not to judge. Totally agree. Totally agree. Can you tell me, um, let's just, in your career, What's your most proudest moment? I'll tell you a funny story. Um, maybe not my proudest moment. There's a few. But um, when I was working at Lancome, uh, so it was so interesting about cosmetics. So Bloomingdale's in New York, very big retailer. Uh, there was always a competition between Estee Lauder and Lancome. And they were always physically structured to be like right across from each other. And so I was this little coordinator, and we were planning on some big promotion. And I had the audacity to get a boom box with John Sousa marching band music and put it behind the Lancome counter for the promotion and mm -hmm. blast it. And it was, and we had like a flurry of people, but it caused such a shit storm. Wow. They were like, what is going on? Um, anyway, we did really well that weekend at Bloomingdale's flagship store on 59th Street in Lexington oh, wow. Avenue. It was great. So that was like a little haha -ha, uh, fun moment. Um, uh, I would say uh, most recently, uh, it was quite an honor for the Institute to be recognized by the Television Academy. And uh, we received the Governor's Award. That's amazing. Uh, and, and, and that was such a sense of pride for our team. And also to be acknowledged by the very people that we're targeting, which is content creators. Yep. And so to have your peers recognize our organization was really a once in a lifetime kind of moment. That's amazing. Um, that's, that's amazing. Um, God, I have so many questions I can ask you. And I'm, t I'm tempted to say, does and anybody And it's like Cindy and I are blocking you from the booze. <laughs> Just so if anybody's I know, wondering. By the way, I know. But, but by the way, does anybody out there have questions for Madeline? I can keep asking my own just because I'm so curious and fond of her. But I'm curious if anybody else has anything. Go ahead. Oh, hi. What is my what? Your why? Because it's, I think it's really, really important that um, that the content um, that we are creating uh, can be inspirational, not preachy, not messagey, but that we should all be able to see ourselves yeah. on screen. Yeah. Um, and you know, when you think about just the U.S. population, it's fifty percent female. It's seven percent LGBTQIA. It's twenty-five percent, you know, people with disability. If you know, with disabilities, it's, you know, when you think about, you know, forty percent of our population are people of color. It's really important that the world of make believe can be more reflective, mm -hmm. um, because what happens in the world of make believe can have real-world impact. As you may know, a lot of people here in the room may have pursued a STEM career or an education or played a sport because of something that they saw um, on screen. So that's kind of what keeps you know, me going is being able to strive um, you know, to achieve that because the feedback that we get. Um, so for example, um, you know, a show like Doc McStuffins, which was the first animated show ever to show a female black doctor of color animation. Um, and having a little daughter that was trying to be a doctor to her toys. I mean, there were um, black female doctors in the United States that were writing into Chris Nee, who's this fabulous showrunner creator, telling her that it was the first time they ever saw wow. themselves represented in TV and also in animation um, to inspire other young girls. So that's what really gets me really excited um, and, and going. That's amazing. I don't know of that animated show, but I'm gonna have to watch it. That's great. That's that's amazing. And by the way, very good question. Was there somebody else there that had their hand up? It's hard to see here. Sorry. 
Go ahead. It's to you, you, right? Are you you're the producer. Where? You're the producer. We look for anything commercial at mine. Um, I have been in the business for a long time, and although I really appreciate art house films, um, I want to make movies that people want to see now. And so anything that's commercial, whether it's thriller or horror or action or Oscar worthy, we'll take a look at it. Um, as long as it's good. It's so hard to find good narrative stories out there. I can't tell you. It's, you know, so good is good. Well, we don't produce content. Um, we have executive produced some things and in order to help other people, um, we, per, we executive produced a, a documentary called This Changes Everything, which was about uh, discrimination in Hollywood um, in, uh, against women, um, but we really don't produce. We're a research-driven advocacy group, so our funding, most of our funding goes to research. Which is great, and so if I had to say, I know if I had to say how do I use my power or power her for today, um, I like to use my, my power to gather all my resources to really make a difference. I mean, to me, leaving a footprint for someone else to follow or making the world a better place is so important. I mean, it's not just rhetoric or hearsay. It's something that I live every day. How can you and your company and Gina just make a difference in the world, um, other than what we are hearing that you're doing anyways? And you know, how can other people get involved? Um, besides donating, besides donating. Um, um, uh, no gift is too large by the way no I mean really use your voice um, what's wonderful it's kind of the another double-edged sword is that um, you know you have such a powerful voice by using your social media platforms uh, you know what streaming platforms are you supporting what movies are you going to see you know it's kind of the power of the wallet you know as well and uh, you may have more influence than what you think. And major brands and major entertainment companies, they are watching your comments. They're watching your TikToks. They're watching your YouTube. Um, so there's a lot more opportunity to, for you to have a direct conversation. Um, there's, we don't really don't have the gatekeeper anymore because, because of the voice we can have. Um, secondly, all of the research that we do is free. It's on our website. We have toolkits. We have um, all kinds of tip sheets. And sharing the research, sharing it on social media, sharing it with your neighbors, sharing it, you know, with your school. Um, you know, if you're in a position and you're working in a corporate and you want us to present, we're happy to present our research. I mean, that's how we make change so mm -hmm. so there's a lot there's a lot that you can do and if you are in a situation where you have children in your life pay attention to what they're watching because it's not that don't censor them but there's definitely an opportunity to say you know hey uh do you think that girl could have been the astronaut or uh you know uh uh, you know, and it works both ways. I mean, one of the things Sarah was talking about is this kind of hyper masculinity. Not all little boys are born to be sports athletes. So, um, you know, where is their kindness? So, there's a lot of things that you can do, but pay attention to what your kids are watching. Absolutely. And we'll wrap this up soon, but to go to what you just said, in this world that kind of, and this is just going to be an off the cuff question. But the world is getting somewhat dark right now. We've got some leaders that are kind of voicing um, things that are tearing us apart. How do you think, using again your power, your platform, and whatever, how can everybody out here make a difference to try to unite us all together? It's fine to use rhetoric of, you know, we're all going to get involved with this, this, and this. But I don't see people really doing anything. I, I, I see people 
cowering and kind of shaking their heads and listening without going out to really try to make a difference. And I think that you are someone like myself that I'm going to make a difference every day. So, and like you just said, everybody can do it. I don't care where you are and what station you are in your life. You can go out and hug somebody. You can go out and smile to somebody. You can give a dollar to somebody. You can pay someone's grocery bill that's behind you. But it is very important that we, as a planet and as humanity, find ourselves in a compassionate role again. I cannot stress this enough. And so, Madeline, someone like you can really, really, really make a difference. I know you already are. And if you could end this session with telling people what you can do and what they can do. Well, I think um, I do want to hearken back to what Sarah said is vote. Um, uh, the next thing is empathy and kindness. I think it's really, really important when you encounter someone, maybe they're hostile, you don't know what's going on in their life. They may be caring for uh, an aging parent. They may have um, a child with a uh, terminal illness. They may have gotten fired you know, from their job. You really don't know. Um, and to just take a beat, take a breath, mm -hmm. um, think before you act, think before you send the email, think before you tweet, think before you post, um, and just try to put kind of empathy um, at the forefront. Um, because I think, you know, trying to make the world a kinder place while we're dealing with all this turmoil is kind of the best thing as that we could do for humanity. I agree. I agree. I literally, that's how I would like to end this session is because it's what we need right now. It's what the world needs right now. I can hear that song singing right now, what the world needs now. Um, and I just encourage everybody in this room to use their voice to make a difference. What an honor. You're a powerhouse. Yeah, no, you really are. All right, does anybody else have any questions before we wrap this up and then you guys can drink and eat and do whatever you want? Oh, there's another performance? Okay, then we're going to get off and watch the other performance. Thank you so much. Right.